from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you all for coming today. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really delighted to see you here. I'm Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division. And I'm uh, really happy that we're having such a timely topic today, that we're having Janet Goldner coming and talking to us about Mali a subject that has worried us tremendously, especially uh, in, in, in the last couple of months. Um, we at the library here have been for uh, more than a decade uh, working on Mali, on and off, depending on our resources, which have been rather limited. Um, and our uh, Afri West Africa, Francophone Africa uh, specialist, Marita Harper, has been in the forefront. She, almost 10 years ago, brought to us the library. Uh, the president of Mali uh, was here and we were able, uh, with, with the Smithsonian as well, uh, to have a major display of manuscripts uh, on Mali. Um, Chris Murphy, who is not here now, but also who worked on this project, um, helped um, the division, the African and, and, and Middle Eastern division, put together an absolutely splendid um, uh, exhibit on manuscripts from Mali. And for most of the people who visited the library at that time, it was the first time they had seen not only a manuscript from Mali, but also had seen the literary tradition that existed for hundreds of years in Africa and which they were not aware of. So it was, it was, it was a surprise and it was also a discovery. And building on that uh, exhibit, uh, which lasted um, uh, briefly a few weeks, um, we were able to digitize those manuscripts to make them available to people uh, who, were, who wanted to follow this up. And indeed, there was a great deal of interest. Uh, we had uh, media coverage, major newspapers uh, were uh, covered the subject. And uh, then again, with very meager resources, um, we pursued the subject of trying to get more manuscript digitized. But of course, there were all kinds of problems. There were pro problems of uh, patrimony laws where you, know, you really cannot take materials out of a country. Uh, we cannot purchase them, but we could digitize them. And so perhaps you've been following some of the programs on television and you've seen Abdel Kader Haidara uh, the head of uh, one of the private libraries in, in Mali appearing and talking. And he himself came to the library and carried with him some of uh, his own manuscripts. And Mike Newbert, who's sitting here, worked with us as well to get those manuscripts uh, digitized and made available uh, to, the, to the public. And today, um, those manuscripts are on the web not only are they on the web, but there are photographs as well that have accompanied it. And again, I want to, to uh, thank Marita Harper for pursuing uh, the subject, for getting some very important um, photographers um, like Alexandra Huddleston, uh, who took some absolutely extraordinary photographs uh, in Mali. And we purchased those photographs and again, put them up on the web to make those photographs available to get people, give people the sense that they're not only manuscripts, but there are people who live around those manuscripts, who live with those manuscripts, who use those manuscripts. Those manuscripts are really live things. I wanted also to share with you um, before, before I sit down, some of the things that are available online that for those of you who are interested in Mali uh, could find in our collections digitized, digitally available. 
the law library has done a great job in getting some of uh, the documents of, of Mali online. For example, human rights reports. Uh, it also has U.S. government reports are available on Mali. Um, there are a special, there's a special guide to law online, laws from Mali, including constitution. The constitution, the laws regarding uh, family laws, uh, regarding Islamic laws, um, attempts at making changes uh, to modernize family laws, there are Sharia laws, Islamic law there. There are also a number of, uh, of the photographs we've just been talking about. Um, there are maps uh, of Mali. And there are media uh, reports, uh, some as recent as uh, two or three months ago. So please, um, after this uh, presentation, if you want to follow, go on our online catalog and you'll find all these wonderful um, materials available online. And again, I really want to recognize the important role that Marita Harper has played in the past decade <laughs> in getting Mali on the map at the library and worldwide because whatever we put up on our website uh, was, is available today uh, everywhere else. So again, thank you for coming, Marita. Thank you, uh, Mary Jane. Um, you know that I'm Marita Harper, and I'm the area specialist in the uh, African section of African and Middle Eastern Division. Um, I met today's speaker in Mali, uh, Janet Goldner, in 2002 when I participated in the Ink Road Conference in Bamako, Mali. Um, my uh, pres uh, presentation at that conference uh, was on the existence of Muslim manuscripts in the United States during slavery, during the period of slavery. And in particular, uh, the existence of a biographical manuscript written by Omar ibn Said, uh, who uh, lived in slavery in uh, North Carolina. Um, the purpose of that Ink Road Conference in 2002 uh, was to discuss how to continue to preserve uh, ancient manuscripts from around the continent of Africa, in particular Mali, Niger, Morocco, uh, uh, um, Nigeria, Chad, uh, South Africa, just to name a few of the countries. And it was a, a discussion to find out how can we continue to preserve these manuscripts because at this point in time, uh, we have problems with infestations of uh, um, insects and other water damage and things like that happen to these manuscripts that were hidden um, during the period of colonialism uh, in a lot of instances. And at this time, they would uh, preserve them so they can bring them out as such. Um, so uh, later, uh, during that conference, um, the, uh, since it was the government of Mali sponsored uh, was, was co-sponsored with the U.S. Uh, Embassy, the, um, uh, the support of the, um, this particular conference. And they actually took participants, uh, and I was included, <laughs> uh, to uh, Timbuktu, where we actually saw the manuscripts in their natural habitat. And uh, um, uh, for me, uh, the rest, is history because um, we were able to, here at the Library of Congress to um, uh, actually put about 13 of these manuscripts on exhibit uh, in the summer of 2003 um, um, and was able to show the president of Mali uh, who visited during that period of time because 
during that summer, the Smithsonian of Folk Life Festival highlighted Mali and all its cultural uh, attributes at that time. And so uh, for the library, we were able to later, in 2003, to actually digitize the uh, more manuscripts as uh, my chief uh, uh, mentioned earlier. And there is our beginning involvement with uh, Timbuktu. Now, Janet Goldner spends much time in Mali. Um, she makes, uh, she was awarded a Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship to Mali in 1999, 95, oh, my glasses aren't clear. <laughs> uh, she also served as a Fulbright um, scholar and, and specialist in Mali as well as in Zimbabwe on the R. She makes freestanding steel sculptures and wall-bound installations that uh, reference her artistic uh, lineage, going back to the welded sculpture of Julio Gonzalez. Her work displays her social consciousness and her deep continuing interest in African art. Her work has been exhibited throughout the US and internationally. Highlights include the Global Africa Project at the Museum of Arts and Design 2010 and 11, uh, Women Facing AIDS at the New Museum 1989, and stated Have We Met at Cologne University in 2007. Janet's work is the collection of the American, of Embas uh, uh, I'm sorry, Janice's work is in the collection of the American Embassy in Mali and the Islip Museum on Long Island. Janet, would you come up and talk some more about the heritage <laughs> of uh, Mali? Thank you. So I want to thank uh, Marietta and the library for inviting me to come and speak here, and I want to thank all of you for coming as well. Um, what's on the screen that you've been looking at is an image of my work that's in the collection of the American Embassy in, in Mali, in Bamako. I first traveled to West Africa in 1973 as an undergraduate at Antioch College in Ohio. I spent three months in Ghana with the experiment in international living and then traveled in West Africa for the rest of the year. The heart of my journey was Mali. And so these photographs are from 1973. Um, at the top, you can see the Dogon dancers and um, just a little flavor of my um, trip in 1973. Oop. There it goes. Okay. Um, during my Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship in Mali, I worked with potters, metalsmiths, and contemporary artists. A practicing artist myself, my African experiences um, since 1973 began to coalesce and emerge in my artwork. Since then, I've spent several months in Mali almost every year, working on a wide variety of cultural, educational, and women's empowerment projects, including short documentary videos and writing, collaborations with contemporary artists, and mentoring a group of Malian women artists. And my photo book, um, Obama in Mali, was published recently. There it is. Um, my artwork, teaching, writing, and lecturing are methods of communicating my experiences, observations, and convictions. On the screen, you see my large public sculpture, Most of Us Are Immigrants, which was originally sited in the Sarah, Sarah Roosevelt Park on Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, and is now in the permanent collection of the Islip Museum on Long Island. This work celebrates immigration as an integral and continuing part of the American experience. The five eight-foot-tall steel vessels weave together the words of immigrants across, um, across history and across time, across ethnicity, linking those of us whose families have been here for a long time with those of us who have arrived very recently. 
We're having an issue with the advancing. There it is. Um, this piece is called Granary. Um, it's a, um, the association um, Segu Laben, a group of artists in Segu Mali, invited me to collaborate with them to create a steel sculpture for a traffic circle on the major highway that leads from Bamako further north in the country. The work is based on Bamana history, symbolism, and mythology, and the sculpture plays an important role in the renewal of Segu. So there's the finished piece, and then there's some of my collaborators um, as we were working on on the sculpture. Okay. Um, in, this talk, in this talk, I will introduce Mali's four UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Jene, Timbuktu, the, the Tomb of the Askas in Gao, and the Dogon, Dogon country. But first, a little history. The Republic of Mali is a landlocked country in the center of West Africa. It was the site of three great empires, the Ghana Empire, the Wagadu, the Mali Empire, and the Songhai. The Niger River traverses the country from the savanna area in the south to the desert area in the north. The climate is of the tropical Sahelian type, characterized by a single rainy season, um, which lasts roughly from June to September. The hottest time of the year is April and May. The first of the empire, and this, this you, can, you can trace the, the, the three empires. The first of the empires was the Wagadu, which from the 4th to the 11th century grew rich from cattle and gold. Um, and you can see it's the, well, you, the Mali Empire reached its prim, pinnacle of power and wealth during the 14th century, extending over almost all of West Africa and controlling virtually all the rich trans-Saharan gold trade. It was during this period that Mali's great cities, Timbuktu and Jenne, became fabled centers of wealth, learning, and culture. The 15th century, in the 15th century, the Mali Empire fell to the Songhai, who had established their capital at Gao. The old kingdoms of Mali and Ghana are not the present-day countries of Mali and Ghana. Um, but their names pay homage to these, to these empires. At its peak, from 1200 to 1300, the Mali Empire extended across West Africa to the Atlantic Ocean and incorporated an estimated 40 to 50 million people. The administration of such an enormous territory was formidable and relied on the establishment of sens government sensitive to the diversity of the land, population, and cultures and accepting of indigenous rulers and their customs. What distinguished the empires of West Africa, particularly Mali and later Songhai, was their ability to centralize political and military power while allowing local rulers to maintain their identities alongside Islam. The imperial powers were located in active commercial centers like Jenne, Timbuktu, and Gao. Um, the, wealth, the wealth of the Mali Empire is illustrated by the Mali Emperor Mansa Musa's pilgrimage to, to Mecca in 1324. His entourage reportedly included thousands of soldiers, officials, and attendants. Attendance, and he distributed so much gold on his pilgrimage that he depressed the world gold price for several years. The journey brought Mali to, the, to international attention as is shown in the 1375 Catalan Atlas. And this was kind of the first time that Mali appears in an international document like this. In the late 19th century, Mali became a French colony and gained its independence in 1960. On the screen is an image of Modi Boketa, Mali's first president. Since then, it has had a socialist government for eight years and then suffered 23 years of dictatorship. Since 1992, Mali has had a new constitution and an elected co government. Mali's constitution provides for a multi-party democracy with the only restriction being a prohibition against parties based on ethnic, religious, regional, or gender lines. Mali has a tripartite system of government consisting of executive, judicial, and le legislative branches. In, 1990, in 2012, the ongoing political crisis erupted. That's another conversation, which I'd be happy to have, but we don't have time to do this and that at the same time. 
Um, but the current lecture is part of this discussion about some of the consequences of the crisis and about how what happens in Mali should be the concern to, of all of us. Um, Mali's population consists of a number of different peoples, including Bamana, who are the largest single segment, the Songhai, Mandinka, Sanufo, Fula, Dogon. The last of these groups, the Dogon, are world renowned for their artwork and their cliff, cliff dwellings, which are another of the World Heritage Sites. The majority of Mali's people are Muslim, although Mali, Mali's government is secular, and the official language is French. Bamanankan, however, is the country's true lingua franca. So here, here's a map of Mali, and you can see the little light rose colored that shows you where Jenne is. Um, um, in, inhabited since two, 250 BC, at least, Jenne became a market center and an important link in the trans-Saharan gold trade in the 15th and 16th century is one of the centers of Islam. Its traditional houses, of which nearly 2,000 have survived, are built on hillocks, hillocks to protect from seasonal floods. Jenny is known for its, its, grand, its, its grand mosque, the largest adobe building in the world. Constructive blocks made from a mixture of rice husks, husks earth, and water it is a, an impressive four-story high structures with three minarets almost 60 meters tall. Jenne and Jenne Geno, ancient Jenne, are, six, are successive tell settlements in the upper inland Niger Delta of Mali, which together span over 2,000 years of continuous occupation, and both are UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. Um, Today, today's, today, Jenny's stunning uh, adobe architecture in distinctive Sudanic style exemplified by the Grand Mosque is a legacy of Jenny's trade routes with North Africa. The original mosque was built in the 13th century. The current one was reconstructed by the French in the early, th early 20th century using local masons. In the 13th century, Jenny rivaled Timbuktu in prosperity and Muslim culture. Um, Jenne, a city of mud brick houses li lining narrow winding streets, continues to be an important center of Islamic learning. And pay attention, whoops, pay attention to this door um, on the, uh, in the slide, because you'll see it again when we get to Timbuktu. And so here is a picture of the mosque um, and with the market in front of it. Um, a remnant of its trading history is the world-renowned Monday market around the mosque. And then on the other side, th thousands of students come every year to study in Jenny's Quranic schools. Jenny is a spiritual center with a great impact on the teachings of imams and marabouts in all of West Africa. Here, students learn the Quran by heart, plus reading and writing, geography, mathematics, and law. Three kilometers southeast of Jenne is an 82-acre mound of Jenny Geno. Scientific excavations in the 70s and 80s by Rod and Susan McIntosh of Rice University pen penetrated six meters of deposits um, that reveal Jenny Geno was founded in 200 BCE um, by iron-using peoples who cultivated rice, millet, herded stock, fished, hunted, and shows early indigenous growth of trade and social complexity. So this is important because, because there's, to show that they were ironworking peoples because there had been um, theories that the ironworking came from North Africa and, and Europe and all of that, but this shows that it was practiced here in Jenne at a very early time. Um, the population that settled Jenne Geno used and worked Fashion, fashioning metal into both jewelry and tools. Um, since there, are, there were no sources of iron ore in the floodplain, the earliest inhabitants of Jenny Geno were already trading with areas outside the region. They also imported stone grinders and beads, and the presence of two Roman or Hellenistic beads in the early levels suggested that a, very, that, that a few very small trade goods were reaching West Africa, probably after changing hands through many intermediaries. And so this is, this is um, the um, head of the, the cultural mission at Jenne, 
Um, and there's a big plaque and this is the, the entrance to the archaeological site. Um, and this is, this is a, a round bricks. And the, the part of why this is important to World Heritage is that there is this use of round bricks for the construction in ancient Jene. Uh, and so you can date the old buildings by the ones that still show the round bricks. And this is a house foundation. The settlement grew ra rapidly. This is in Genigeno, the archaeological site, reaching its maximum size by about 850 AD. Other excavations and surface investigations document the development during the same period of most of the nearby 69 sites. This is a cemetery. The natural floodplain environment was effectively transformed into a cultural constructed landscape of large man-made seasonal islands. This created a remarkable concentration of population, 10,000 to 27,000 people within the integrated multi-site system known as the Jenny Geno urban complex. And so this is, this is a burial ground and people were buried in um, pottery vases. Um, and sunk in the ground. And, and here you can see in one of them, it, as there's erosion, so, so then these pots get, get exposed. And so you can see in this one, there's a part of a skull that's, that's in, there's a, can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Um, that, 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 that's been, been exposed recently. Um, the appearance of exotic trade goods such as copper and stone suggests that the population went hand in hand with increasing trade. And this is an empty pot. So, so there's, there, there's, this is another one where, where it's been exposed, but there's also this fight with people who are raiding the site to sell artifacts. And so this is, this is part of that story as well. Um, these discoveries uh, effectively refuted the assumption that urban settlements and long distance trade in West Africa were secondary to the development of trans Saharan trade by North African Arabs after the ninth century. Um, and the whole site is littered with pottery shards. And so this is a few of the many images I have of, of the pottery shards, but showing the different ways that they're decorated shows um, that happened in different times. And so it's showing different periods of development. Um, so the settlement at Jenny Geno started to decline around um, 1200 AD, and the settle settlement was definitively ab abandoned by about 1400. Um, these are pots at the um, cultural mission in, in, in Jenne. Um, that most of the nearby mounds followed the same pattern. This abandonment was approximately concurrent with the early settlement at the current city of Jenne. So all of these could be the subject of, you know, day-long lifetimes worth of conferences. So this is just a little bit of a smattering of the richness of what exists in Mali. So now we're, now we're going to move to Timbuktu. And you can see I've left Jene on there, but then there's, you can see Timbuktu kind of highlighted in a rose colored further north. Timbuktu, a sacred city in Mali, the city of 333 saints, was an important center of commerce and learning in the Middle Ages. It has been the natural meeting point of, okay. it has been the natural meeting point of Songhai, Wangara, Fulani, Tuareg, and Arabs. Timbuktu was listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to its holy places, which were vital to the early Islamization of Mali, uh, of Africa. Timbuktu, Timbuktu's Mali show a cultural and scholarly golden age during the Songhai Empire. The construction of the mosque, still mostly original, shows the use of traditional building techniques. Timbuktu has three of the oldest mosques in the world. It is the sister city of Jenne and an important intellectual and, and spiritual center. Merchants from northern Africa um, traded salt and gold in the markets of Timbuktu. According to inhabitants of Timbuktu, gold came from the south, salt from the north, 
and divine knowledge from Timbuktu. And this is a, just a, from the roof of a building over the, the town of Timbuktu. This is, this is um, Senkore, the mosque, which was the site of the University of Timbuktu. Um, during the 15th century, a number of Islamic institutions were erected. The most famous of these is the Senkore Mosque, also known as the University. It had 25,000 students in the 16th century and became a center of Islamic scholarly community in Timbuktu. It was composed of a series of independent schools or colleges, each run by a single master. Students associated themselves with the teacher and courses took place in open courtyards of mosques, mosque complexes, or in private residences. Scholars wrote their own books as part of a socioeconomic model based on scholarship. The profit made by buying and selling of books was second only to the gold and salt trade. And among the most formidable scholars, professors, and lecturers was Ahmed Baba. This is a part of the, the Jinjiri Bear Mosque, um, which was initially, con the initial construction dates back to the Sultan Khan Khan Musa re returning from his pilgr hills pilgrimage pilgrimage to Mecca and was built and enlarged in, the, in 1570 and 1583 when the southern part of the wall um, was added. The central minaret dominates the city and is one of the most visible landmarks um, in the landscape of Timbuktu. So uh, just to add a little bit about the current crisis here. So this is what's, what's been hard for people to understand. I mean, this is an Islamic holy city that was occupied and many of its monuments were in danger. Um, and to, I think to call the people who are occupying Islamists does, an, does a, a disservice to Islam. I think that they are fanatics and that fanatics of any stripe hide, often hide behind philosophies. But this is, this is, this is a, a divine city. Um, and so to put these sacred structures and way of life into um, danger can't be a way to, to advance um, Islam. Um, I told you to pay attention to that door in Jene. Um, these are the doors of the Sidi Yaya Mosque. And these doors were damaged, a part of what was damaged during the occupation. Um, con the construction of the Sidi Yaya Mosque was begun in 1400 by a Marabu Sheikh El Mokhtar Hamala in anticipation of a holy man who appeared 40 years later in the, per in the person of Sharif Sidi Yaya, who was chosen as its first imam and head professor. This marked the beginning of the mosque as a madrasa and a center of great learning for the region. Now, this is, this is a, picture, a before and after picture of one of the mausoleums, which is part of what was, part of why Timbuktu is a World Heritage Site and part of what was destroyed during, during this occupation. And so you can see an old picture of it before and then a, there's a small inset of, of its more or less current I, I think the full assessment hasn't been done yet. So this is, this is the best I could do in terms of, and these are really the burial places of some of these 333 saints. Um, and, and so the people who were occupying said that the worship at these sites was idolatry. And so that was part of their justification for destroying them. Um, and so this is, this is the, the most, but the, one of the most outstanding treasures at Timbuktu are the 100,000 manuscripts kept by the great families in the town. Now this is a trunk. I, I, I went to um, Timbuktu every year for several years and, 
And before there's a library, this is the condition that many manuscripts and many of, many of these, these great families have their manuscripts in. They've been preserved in these trunks. They're, they're, and so these, this effort by the world community and the Malians and the South Africans have done a lot of digitizing. These are, these are people's heritage. And so some of them are in the Ahmed Baba Center, but some of them stay with um, the families. And so this is, was a library. They were trying to raise money to open a building, but he opened, this, this man opened up the trunk. Um, I believe this was from the formation of the, the Bagayogo Library um, to show us what the condition of the manuscripts were in um, at that point. Um. So, so this manuscript, the manuscripts in Timbuktu, some of which dated from, from pre-Islamic times, have been preserved as family secrets in the town and other villages nearby. Most were written in Arabic or Fulani by wise men coming from the Mali Empire. Their contexts were didactic, especially the subjects of astronomy, music, and botany. More recent manuscripts deal with law, sciences, history, religion, and trading. The Ahmed Baba Center, founded in 1970 by the Malian government with collaboration of UNESCO, hold some of these manuscripts to restore and digitize them. More than 1,800 manuscripts have been collected at the Ahmed Baba Center, but there are an estimated 300,000 to 700,000 manuscripts in the region. So one of the things, okay, so this is, and this is the, from the, the, um, the Mohammed Hydra library that, that um, Marietta talked about. Um, so you can see that there's a difference between this manuscripts kind of crumbling in a trunk and what happens when these, library, these, these manuscripts can be put into better condition and preserved in a better way. Private libraries and towns have, so have pre preserved the manuscripts. There's a, so there's the Mama Hydra Library. There's also the Fondokate Library, which has about 3,000 records from, of Andalusian origin um, and, and, and many other ones. Um, and these are just, just examples of some of the, the documents. This is music and genealogy. Um, at one time, there were 120 libraries with manuscripts in Timbuktu and surrounding areas. The full extent of the manuscripts is unknown. And this is, a, this is an illustrated Quran. After the fall of the Songhai Empire, many, mal li many libraries and scholars were forcibly exiled to Morocco and their libraries stolen. Um, during the colonial era, efforts were made to conceal the documents after a number of entire libraries were taken to Paris, London, and other parts of, of Europe. So, the, you know, the, the recent reports of the burning of manuscripts in Timbuktu and the librarians knowing how and where to protect them is something that's really just a part of the history of the really courageous people who take care of these manuscripts and the manuscripts themselves. This is not the first time. I think what's shocking for us is that, is, is that the history continues today, but it's really part of their history. Some manuscripts were buried underground, others were hidden in the desert or in caves, and many from that period are still hidden today. So during the current crisis, the Ahmed Baba Center was burned, but, manuscript, but reports indicate that most of the manuscripts had been removed for safekeeping. Again, as part of, this is just part of their history. And a little bit of the life, this is an embroidery workshop in Timbuktu where the traditional embroidery is still carried on by the same family that's been doing it for centuries. And here's a picture of the hand embroidery, mainly for Grand Boubou, um, um, that's done there. And there's a special kind of bread just, just to give you a, it's a living city where, and so I don't want you to think that there's only ancient artifacts that are there. <laughs> and so, um, okay, so now we're moving on to Gao. Um, and this, this is the tomb of the Askias, which is, which is the protected site in, in Gao. The dramatic 17-meter pyramidal structure of the tomb of the Askia was built by Askio Muhammad, emperor of the Songhai, in 1495 in his capital, Gao. 
It bears testimony to the power and riches of the empire that flourished in the 15th and 16th century through its control of, the again, the trans-Saharan trade, notably salt and gold. So they were trading, you know, gold comes from the south and salt comes from the north. So there was this bartering of salt for gold. It's also a fine, a fine example of monumental adobe traditions of West African Sahel, this complex, including pyram the pyramidal tombs and two flat mosque buildings. And they, there's this often this kind of ex external scaffolding that appears on adobe buildings in West Africa. Part of it's decorative, and also these, these buildings have to be re-mudded, re-plastered just about every year, and so this provides the way to get up there and perform the maintenance on these buildings. And this is a, a staircase that leads up to, to the door to the tomb. Um, so the mosque, the, the mosque cemetery and open air assembly ground was built when Gao became the capital of the Songhai Empire after Askyo Muhammad had returned from Mecca and made Islam the official religion of, of his empire. The tomb is a, is a 500 year old adobe, adobe pyramid with a view of the river and town as well as a small mosque whose original building materials were imported from Mecca. And now we're moving to the Dogon, and where you can see kind of in a circle over there. And as <coughs> Dogon country has, a, has an out, outstanding landscape of cliffs and sandy plateau with beautiful architect, age-old social traditions that live on in the, in the region. The communities at the site are essentially the Dogon and have very close relationships with their environment expressed in their sacred rituals and traditions. The sandstorm cliff rises about 500 meters above the lower sandy flats in the south. It has a length of approximately 93 miles. The area of the escarpment is inhabited today by the Dogon people, but the Dogon, before the Dogon, the escarpment was inhabited by the Telum, and many structures from the Telum remain. Most of the Dogon live in more than 700 small villages scattered over 15,000 square miles in the Bandiagara region a high cliff area and the natural caves. And the, the Telum dwellings, um, ancient dwellings, are the ones that are higher up the cliff, right under the, the bot, in that, those little caves under there. That, those were the Telum dwellings that still exist. That's. Some Dogon live on the sandy plateau above the cliff, the rest live in the, the sandy plains. In 1930, the, until 1930, the Dogon were isolated from the rest of the world and were opposed to foreign influences um, on their culture and society. For many years, this protected the Dogon from attacks by outsiders. The Dogon are famous for the distinctive village architecture, beautiful carved wooden masks, and granary doors. And the building at the back with the, hole, the, with the holes in it is, is called an etage. I don't know what it's called in Dogon. Um, the Hogan, which is, who is the spiritual leader of the village, um, is in charge of all the religious agrarian rituals that are to guarantee suffi sufficient future crops and by extension to ensure the perpetuation of his people. And so this is the, this is, um, the Hogan's house, the chief's house. And there's another one further back in this courtyard. And there's this wonderful texture of the, the adobe with, these, with the, the stones. And so there's this really wonderful, almost fabric-like texture that is in Dogon villages. And, just, and, and in many, many houses, you can see this blackboard that's implanted in, in the wall, and that's so that the kids can practice their, their lessons when they go to school. Um, in certain cultural areas, the Dogon villages comprise numerous granaries, for the most part square with thatching tapering roof. Um, it's, the, the granaries are generally built on two levels. Its facade is 
windowless, but has a series of niches and doors, often decorated with sculptural motifs. And this, this is a, there are male granaries where, where um, the grain of the family is kept, and that's really like the bank of the family. And this is the female granary, which is where w women store their objects, and her husband has no access. Um, it looks like a grain, like, like a male granary, um, but this is, but it's it's constructed a little bit differently. And this is where women can store their personal belongings, such as clothes, jewelry, money, and and some food. Dogon art is primarily sculpture. Themes found throughout Dogon sculpture consist of figures with raised arms, superimposed bearded figures, horsemen, stools, women with children. Figures raise, co covering their faces, women grinding millet, women bearing vessels on their head. Um, and this, this is one of the, the carved doors. And here's a, um, a carver. So one of the, the UNESCO criteria for making this a World Heritage Site, the land of the Goat Dogon, is the outstanding manifestation of a system of thinking li linked to traditional religion that has integrated harmoniously with architectural heritage, very remarkably in the natural landscape of rocky scree and impressive geographic features. And that's a detail of what he's carving. The intrusion of new written religions, Islam and Christianity, since at least the 18th century has contributed toward the vulnerability of the heritage that today suffers the, from the adverse effects of globalization. Again, this is still from the, the UNESCO criteria. And here's, a, here's a weaver. Um, the relationship of the Dogon people with their environment is also expressed in the sacred rituals associating spirituality, spiritually the pale fox, the jackal, and the crocodile. And here's a blacksmith. Um, the, the villages and their inhabitants are faithful to the an ancestral va values linked to an original lifestyle. Never, nevertheless, the traditional practices associated with living quarters and building constructions have become vulnerable. Atugana um, is the town hall. Men dis rest discuss and take important decisions in the Tugana. The roof of the Tugana is made by eight la layers of millet stalks. It is a low building in which one, not, one, not, one cannot stand upright. This helps avoid violence so that if somebody gets mad and stands up, they'll hit their head and sit down. <laughs> And there's a, so this, there's different Tugana. So there's one and there's a stone one. And then here's some people that are reworking some of the designs on the original um, Tugana that I showed you. And this is the market at, at Sangha with, and the red, splot, the red patches are peppers drying on the roof of the low adobe buildings. And you can, um, this is, um, the walking to in the escarpment and there's the dogon gr grow a lot of onions and more more onions closer on the onion fields which is irrigated by the, this water um, there's a form of many forms of divination this is a sand divination where you take your question to the diviner and he he traces out a, a system of um, symbols in the sand, um, and and at night the the fox comes and walks over the table and displaces the designs. And by the way that things are displaced, that's how you get the answer to your question. And of course the the renowned Dogon dancers, and this is all part. Of, and again, I want to leave with you that this is not just ancient heritage, but this is also living culture as well. Culture is a live thing that lives and changes and breathes. Um, and so while we're trying to protect what's ancient, I think we also need to protect what's contemporary. So here's some pictures of, of the dancers.
Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, we do have some time for questions uh, that you have uh, about Molly. Um, Okay, she's saying that the males are doing the artwork, the weaving. Um, that's my fault. That's not true that men do all the artwork in Mali. Um, but weaving, a lot of the, a lot of the different um, occupations are gender-based, and so men are weavers, whereas in, Europe, in most of Europe, um, women are weavers, but women make pottery, they spin spin cloth, they dye it, so it's making of cloth is really takes both men and women. So men and women grow it, women spin it, men weave it, women dye it. <laughs> so it's really, as in many things in Mali, um, it really takes the whole community to exist. Yes. Not so much in building, in construction. It is more adobe and wood in the construction. Um, but metal is certainly um, an important part of Malian culture in terms of tools and as well as ritual objects, as well as jewelry. Um, yeah. No, no. Um, why don't you share? Okay. Well, this is, what yes. she did was to go back and destroy her own records. She, destro she went back to the center and destroyed her own records. In the interest of preserving the art objects in the community where they were made and preventing the easy access by collectors and, of course, also preventing the easy access by scholars. So my question is this. Efforts at trying to preserve and conserve the manuscripts, are they only oriented towards centralizing them like in those nice drawers where you can slide show the library? Or do you try at all to work with increasing work with the, the gatekeepers for their culture? These hundreds of families that have these libraries in the trunk. Do you work with them directly to help them preserve their objects in their own way? Okay, well that's a really great question. And one of the things I want to add to that is that besides the things that were destroyed during the occupation, um, you know, the manuscripts are, have always been in danger um, and have been bought and sold and stolen from, from the Middle Ages through today. And this cri the, cr the current crisis makes them be in more danger. Okay, so that, that, that's one thing. But the, this is actually part of, I'm not a specialist in the manuscripts, but what I know is that um, part of the, the kind of controversy around Ahmed Baba 
is that, I mean, the trunk that I showed you, that, that's, a, that's a family, that's like a, somebody opening up their family jewel box. Those are the diamonds and the rubies and the emeralds. And so not, the, the Ahmed Baba Center was encouraging these families to give them or, or, or lend them, I don't know what the terms were, um, to be protected at the Ahmed Baba Center, give them the manuscripts. And, and as you can imagine, because this is family's heritage, people were reluctant to do it. So that's why I said there were so many manuscripts in the Ahmed Baba Center, but there's many, many more, nobody knows how many, all over the area. Because you can imagine if there's 25,000 students all studying on, with, with manuscripts, there's gonna, be a, there's gonna be a lot of material. So, so yes, these are very important questions. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, there was a couple of days there when we were all kind of um, walking around really, really depressed. And, 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 and then there was this wonderful story of triumph when, we, when it came out that these manuscripts had yet again been, been, been rescued. And, 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 and so it really puts our time, as I said, into just the flow of time, the flow of history. Yeah. The, there's all sort, sorts of levels of Bogolan production, from fine artwork to, to, tourist, to commercial, uh, commercial workshops and everything in between. So um, it's still very much made in Mali. I'm, yeah, there's, there's a whole range of the industry. And one of the groups that I work with um, and have been working with for, for almost 20 years. Um, there's a group of artists who are the ones who are responsible for, for revitalizing Bogolan. In, they were art students in the 70s, and it's called the group Bogolan Kasabani. And they, when they went to art school, the only art techniques that were being taught in, in the art school in the 70s were European um, painting, painting and, and techniques, and so they looked around as artists do all over the world to see what existed in their own culture that could be used, that where they wouldn't have to be buying oil paint and canvases, and really started working and experimenting and finding the meaning of of this ancient tradition and taking it from this this craft that had been used as for women's skirts and hunters' tunics into fine art. So there's this whole range of um, Production. Right. Does the government control any of that production? No. Certain standards? There, there have been efforts to, to brand Bogolan as kind of a trademark, but it, they're, and it, they've been working on it for a long time, not, with, not the government. This is, a, this is part of the other dis conversation that, that we'll have some other time, I hope, but not today. <laughs> um, but um, we haven't been able to establish the kind of like Bolon as a brand. But yes, it would be very important, and it, so, so that the people who who this belongs to and who are making this can actually make a living off of it. But it hasn't happened. Yeah. Could you stand up? I can't. I want to hear you. Um, the, what's the state of the, the, of, of the, the monuments in Timbuktu? The state, well, I think that the full UNESCO, um, report hasn't been done yet. 
I mean, there were just on Monday, I think it was, there was a conference in Paris where the Malian Minister of Culture, the French Minister of Culture, and met at UNESCO, which is in Paris, um, to talk about and commit themselves to doing what they, what they need to do to, to restore these, these elements of world, of world culture. Um, was it better under the French? I can't say that. Um, you know, that's a whole other conversation. I think I, I'm not quite sure what else. Did I, did I answer your question? I'm not sure I'm getting to it. Well, t tell me what. Well, the recent occupation where these criminals, which is all I can call them, were occupying the northern two-thirds of Mali was, a very, was, pro was probably the harshest period of um, Malian history. At least that's what I've been talking to and hear hearing about. But that's not to say that, that the French period was less harsh. I think it was just longer ago. <laughs> you know, this is this is a really long conversation, and I don't think that I can I can answer it um, satisfactorily. Or I mean, this is this 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 is opinion. So you know, I mean, what do I think? I think that the Malians, Malians should have a a strong, responsible um, government that is responsive to its people and its heritage and and its history, and that you know that's what I think should happen. You know, whether it's whether it's you know fan recent fanatical criminals or colonial occupation. I mean, I think we're you know neither one of them are good. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could comment on the position of women and whether it is a position of uh, ethnic groups in Mali, um, in Doba and Bamina, um, and especially girls' education. Um, there's been a big push for girls' education, um, partly funded by USAID. Um, uh, you know, this, that's, a, that, that's, a, that's very complicated, and I hate to generalize because, especially about Africa, because there's too much kind of generalized half information running around about, about um, Africa. So, um, you know, you really need to be very specific about which culture at which time and which aspect, and that's, that's you know, so if you have a more specific question, then I take a stab at it. <laughs> well, um, what percentage of, of girls are educated at the boys? Um, you know, well, this, this question is actually hard to answer because, and this is taking me a little bit into the crisis, because the corruption of the deposed government in Mali that erupted the current crisis meant that the statistics that came out were cooked. So we can't really know is the answer. Not an, but not enough girls and not enough boys go to school. Yeah. We have, two, um, we have time for about two more questions. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I wonder if there is any Jewish influence in Mali. Mali's is, Mali, Mali, a large majority of Mali's people are Muslim, but Mali is a secular state. And that's been part of what this crisis has been about and part of what Malians are very fierce to hold on to was their secularness. And that, that's part of the conflict with the people who are occupying the North and why, okay, um, but Mali's Islam is very influenced by Sufi. So this kind of Sunni Shia thing doesn't really, it could exist now with, with incursions, but that's not part of the Malian dialogue, it's Sufi.
the, the people in, occupying the north. But they're not Malians. They're not Malians. The people who are occupying the north were infiltrated the population and had long enough to intermarry and all of that. And so I'm sure there is some influence. Um, you know, Qatar, Saudi Arabia have been pouring money into Mali and many other places for a long time. So there is some influence, but it's really not part of Malian culture. It's another kind of colonialism. Let's, I see two hands, so let's do both of them. Yeah. Can you stand up so I can hear you? Yeah. Well, this 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 is a lifetime's. This, the question you just asked is a lifetime. I once I, it could take a lifetime to answer it. Originally, they what I understand, and I'm not a specialist in Dogon, and my friend Adam will. <laughs> I'm looking at her while I while I uh, answer. Um, they originally came from the Mande, which is further south in Mali, and they moved to the current area to protect themselves. Um, and I don't know what date, maybe Adam can tell me. Um, and, and so they've lived in this area since they moved from the Monday. And I'm sorry, I don't have the dates. I'd... Can you repeat that for us? Say it. You came from Egypt. But, but, but from Egypt, when you landed, Yes. So just, just to repeat so everybody can hear, Adam says that the, the Dogon came from Egypt. They, they, they eventually arrived in the Mande, which is another part of Mali, and then they went to their current land to preserve the, themselves from outside influences. Yeah. yeah. There's another question over here? Yes. Well, I, you know, I only know, I, I don't think that this has really been established. I know that there were, what the, the, the UNESCO documents keep talking about that I've been reading um, is that, well, there were 16 mausoleums that were protected under UNESCO. So, so those mausoleums, there has been destruction, I believe, of tw some, some level of destruction. I can't tell you what. I don't think it's known yet because UNESCO hasn't really gone that felt like it's safe enough to go and do the report. So there's some level of destruction, I believe, to 12 of them, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And that the manuscripts, we don't know how many have been, were, were burned um, as, they were leaving, as, as the occupiers were leaving Timbuktu. Um, it's not known because the report hasn't been done yet. We don't know. I mean, one can suppose that, that if a lot of the manuscripts, I know these are not accurate numbers, but there aren't any accurate numbers, were, were, were safeguarded somewhere else. What was left to make it like it looked like this wasn't happening are probably the ones that A, I'm guessing, were already digitized, less valuable, I don't know. But there were, they had to leave something there so that it wouldn't look like it was all bare. So what, what, are, what are they leaving? I mean, these, these are the questions. There's not answers yet. UNESCO hasn't sent a mission there. They haven't put through their um, plan of action yet, but they've committed to ha doing that and having a plan of action. This is new. I mean, it's happening now. <laughs> I mean, the, play, the place just got liberated a couple weeks ago. <laughs> With that, uh, we have to close today's uh, lecture, and let's give a round of applause to Janet. <laughs> the past.
came up to the present. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.